I think it's I think it's really fascinating. One of the things about these these two films we're talking about is that both both were fairly immersive films. Um, you know, Jareth with a, with a history uh, in Ghana and, and the time that you all spent there, and both came out telling pretty optimistic stories, which I think is something that one often doesn't see, especially stories um, that are coming out of Africa, and that and yet here. Are, are two, um, you know, two sets of filmmakers who really put themselves in situations and understood situations. And I, I don't know, to me it says something that they came out, that you came out with, with a story that was more, more positive in a way um, and, and found really, really hopeful stories. And, and, and not without their ups and downs, but uh, that, that really struck me in, in, in thinking about both these films. Yeah, together. it's not only that you want it to be just optimistic. It's the way also reality is, and it's always an ups and downs and... and, and and that's that's a good thing you want also to, uh, as 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 for me, that I want to to get. I mean, things are grayish, and sometimes when when it, especially when it comes to Africa, so it's like all black, all white, or oh, see, oh, they are so happy, they they they're smiling, and and plus they suffer so much. So it's like a very cliche type of uh, vision, and the reality is more grayish. I mean, uh, and that's what, and it's the same here. Mm -hmm. It's the same all over the world, and. Uh, I think that's in, in our forthcoming work in Africa because we got all the films coming. We want to also to develop that that kind of vision of of ours, which is a bit pretentious, but <laughs> no, no, it, it's it's dedication. It's not pretentious. <laughs> I think, uh, Jareth, uh, would you agree with that? Uh, your your film, of course, is also in the in the, uh, required immersion and an in, in African setting. You know, I I think we document three filmmakers, um, we run the risk of exploiting our subjects. Um, there's something like the ethics of the documentarian where there's rules you should be following, one says. Um, at least some of my teachers said that in the 80s. Um, and then again, you have to break all these rules to get what you want. So it's sometimes walking a very thin line. But the subject will inform you if you're doing a good job or not. Um, okay. You have to gain trust. And as you go in, and I like what you just said about the preconceived ideas or notions about Africa, you have to become a clean slate and innocent. You, you cannot judge your subjects anymore. Exactly. In our film, the danger was, you know, are we going to be making a propaganda movie for one of the political parties? Or can we remain neutral no matter what our political um, you know, orientation is? So it's, it's, it's a very thin line. But then, you know, you can't predict what happens. We didn't know it was going to be a hopeful story. Um, exactly. I was hoping it was going to be a positive story. I was hoping, you know, the struggle for democracy that we show in our film would inspire people. Um, and, you know, we got very, very lucky. And I think it was because we gained the trust of the subjects and we spent three months prior with them. So they didn't even notice us anymore. We were part of the teams. So, uh, were did you at any time feel that you were then uh, in danger? Uh, <laughs> there's uh, it was uh, are in this film, of course, uh, int and intimations of corruption uh, and of and of violence. Uh, did you uh, did you feel that you were uh, a Western? Uh, uh, journalist at that point or or did you feel that you were really part of the atmosphere in the beginning we were western journalists even I, though i'd grown up in ghana just because you it's very difficult to read the temperature of of the situation at times you know when it gets loud you know we might be oh my god this is the end of us um uh, my dp was like i'm not going to continue working here and then everyone around him is saying like just calm down it's you know this is how people negotiate certain things um, in the end, you just you learn to read the situation. But yes, there were moments where I thought like this could be very dangerous. You know, brick stone, size stones flying against the car, uh, people shooting with live ammunition, the military coming in. Um, you know, if you have thousands of people, the images that have gone around the world from Egypt, um, you know, masses assemble. You, it's easy to be crushed. My brother, who was uh, on the second camera, we had two teams. I was almost crushed in one of those rallies because, you know, it just hell broke loose. Um, it is it is a dangerous endeavor. And again, you know, you have to go with instinct. Um, and healthy instinct will always save you in those situations. And you're also going without a script uh, because you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, 
I've been referring to this as journalism uh, all along. Uh, is there a difference between documentary film and, and journalism as we see it, David? I mean, you know, I think that there's maybe some slightly different, um, you know, codes or sort of directives um, depending on the filmmaker. I mean, there's obviously a breadth of documentary f uh, film. And certainly in the U.S., uh, more than Europe, documentaries have become the long-form journalism. There's just right. very little else left. You know, that's, it's gone from network television. It's gone from a lot of places. And so documentary films are the places to get at those shades of gray, you know, are the places to get at those nuances. Um, I always think about documentary being about honesty rather than accuracy. Mm. I, I find yeah. that that's the, for me, that's sort of the crux and that filmmakers, good filmmakers in their hearts sort of know when they're being honest to their subjects and their story. Um, and that's sort of the guiding guiding principle. But uh, yeah. So if there's a point of view, it comes from the facts. Is that uh, is I don't, that I don't feel close to journalism a bit, you know, because to me it's more like it's another job to me. It's ah. more like you don't have maybe depends on your issue. But uh, uh, as for a subject, you know, we, we followed the band for like six years and we were like emerging in the street with the guys. And so what you were saying, seeing in the background, teach you about what's going on uh, in the country but it's n we were not like focal uh, we, we didn't focus on that so i don't feel i'm a journalist and in for instance in congo journalist is like an insult almost <laughs> and uh, <laughs> at the very beginning we had to f to fight that no, image not only in the congo <laughs> <laughs> no i mean you know, <laughs> I know. but uh, yeah we had to fight that image because uh, usually uh, when there was where white a white team working in the streets it was just you know to show the bad things, right? And uh, like mass corruption, uh, AIDS, uh, murder, street kids. And and uh, when the people from the street, they realized that we were here to show beautiful things, maybe in a, in a subjective way to some extent, extent, the relationship also changed with the people in the street. And uh, the band, you know, the band Abilia being the wise guys, we were very much protected. It was like uh, the, the old guy uh, of the band project and we were very much protected. And we didn't feel we had to tell the truth because the truth was around us, you know? And uh, so the movie doesn't en emphasize on the, how do you say them, the, the political or, or economical aspect. The, the, you get glimpse, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. You get glimpse of what's going on. Uh, what, what, you see, what you see in the background sometimes is enough just to define what the country is going to. Yes. Uh, and uh, the name of the band is Benda Belili. Yeah. Uh, Benda is band? No, Benda Belili, it's in Lingala. There's, it means literally draw the image. Draw the image. Which, I mean, there's not... Uh, m not many words words in Lingala, so you can inter adapt, and uh, it means see beyond, and it means uh, um, see beyond appearances for for those guys who have got no legs and and stuff like that. But it's also it has a prophetic uh, aspect because when we met them in 2004, wh while they were begging for money in the streets of Kinshasa, and they told us, "Yeah, we'll see with you guys. We're going to become the most famous disabled band in the world," and it was back <laughs> in 2004, and so. When we recall that today, it's very like there is a prophetic dimension in their name. Uh, it does seem to be prophetic in, 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 many, uh, in many ways. Uh, uh, Jareth, uh, tell us about uh, what, what is the prophecy from uh, the 2008 uh, election. Uh, uh, one of the things in your trailer is a quote by saying, this is, uh, this is a test to see whether Ghanaians are are ready for true democracy. How would you answer that question? Guineans are ready for democracy because democracy has not been reinvented or reintroduced into parts of Africa. It's been part of the, the old, you know, ancient cultures. Um, it's, it's just a different form of democratic uh, process. So it's it's ingrained in in the people's DNA, so to speak. Um, but what we're seeing now, after 50 years, basically, that black Africa has been independent, is, is an emerging um, stability or, you know, the, the cry for, for a democratic, a stable democratic country. And Guineans have proven that it is possible. You know, they went through three rounds, and you'll see in the film, um, you know, there was no clear winner in the first round, basically had to go into a second round. And, and then, like in, in Florida... At the time, you know, uh, there was a swing state situation. I mean, the system was put to the ultimate test, and Ghanaians proved, and, and, and I find that so inspiring about that election, 
um, that it is possible against all odds, you know, even though you're a third world country, um, there is corruption. Everything that, you know, the preconceived ideas that we have and that we should uh, to exist, um, it is possible to pull off a peaceful election. Uh, so I think Africa is going to be very inspiring for the rest of the world. Um, I think the political system that Ghana uh, has proven to, to <laughs> that, that works will inspire not only the the, black, the other black African countries, it will hopefully spill over to the Arab countries and all the way back to Europe, where there's a certain you know, apathy, I should say, when it comes to voting, you know, where we've lost trust and belief. Uh, and again, uh, there are parallels in other countries, unfortunately, including our own, when we're talking about uh, apathy and, and loss of trust. Uh, and the democracy is probably different everywhere there is a demos, as one of my, uh, as one of my mentors, uh, John Merrill, here at, uh, at Missouri, has always said. Uh, he said, not even the Greeks got it right, exactly. <laughs> yes, it's a people's business. We're all friends out there. We have our special interests. We we are conditioned differently, um, but in the end, you know, it's about. I think it's about a minimum um, security and stability that every person deserves. If it's water, electricity, and uh, you know, healthcare, so be it. But everyone has a right to it, especially in the 21st century. Exactly, uh, David. Uh, I'm going to give you the the final word here, and as we're wrapping up the show. Uh, uh, what's your your best advice for uh, enjoying this uh, the True False uh, festival? Oh, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to to interface with it. There's a, there's a lot going on this weekend. You know, we have 41 features. We have 120 some show screenings. 41. Wow. Um, but you know, I think you can you can dive in and just sort of commit yourself. And people, you know, you can buy a pass or whatever. At this point, um, there's lots of individual tickets left. Um, I think there's certainly tickets left to screenings of both of these films. Uh, ben DeBilly shows tonight at the Missouri Theater um, as part of a, 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 a masquerade we're doing. So I think it's great for beyond appearances. And um, and so, you know, there's you can get tickets. You can come to our box office. There's going to be a great panel this weekend, um, you know, uh, called, I think, Africa 11, uh, about about some of these issues we've been discussing, going a little bit deeper with, with these guys and some other directors, talking about really how one how one goes and, you know, what, what Africa sort of means in the world of documentary. And I think it's going to be a pretty fascinating panel. So, yeah, there's a lot to do. Um, the panels are free. The movies are pretty cheap. Uh, I hope people come out and it's, check it out. It's, it's a great uh, it's a great and inspiring weekend. Uh, just, just one final thought. Uh, like much of good journalism, the truly memorable documentaries, as we've heard today, are not always blockbusters like Michael Moore's Bowling for Columbine or Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth. Uh, nor are they always about worldwide events like this year's Oscar winner about the world financial crisis inside job. Most often, they stick in our minds because of the individuals, the humans, and the very human events uh, that are appearing before our eyes and minds, uh, courtesy of these talented filmmakers. Thanks to our guests, David Wilson, Jareth Mertz, and Barrett Renault. Our director is Travis McMillan, audio by Pat Akers. Our video producer is, is Tim Wall. Rebecca Wolfson is executive producer. The other producers of Global Journalists are David Cawthon, Ryan Kress, and Jessica Bopovic. Stephanie Tabor is the production assistant. This is Byron Scott for Global Journalists, reminding you that you can download, view, or listen to this show, plus additional features, by going to globaljournalists.org.